Th thank you. Uh, thank you, Bima. Uh, it's been 17 years since I met Bima at my first meeting. Uh, I think it's 17. Uh, maybe it's 16. So before I talk about modules, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, C++. You might have heard of it. <laughs> um, I was at a meeting, um, a committee meeting, a couple of years ago, and um, we tend to have breakfast together. And uh, that particular day, I had breakfast with um, Pete Becker. Pete Becker was the project editor for C++ and I think he did a fantastic job. It's, a, it's an unappreciated job. It's a lot of work. Um, and and there's times where, where you're the funnel through which everything has to go. And of course, that's when you want to release the standard. So um, a lot of credit to uh, Pete. But that time, uh, Pete and I were talking, chit-chatting. Chit and uh, he mentioned that he wrote an iPhone app. I'm like, oh, I wrote an iPhone app too. And so we start talking, and I, I tell him how much fun it was to write that app, and, and how, how unlike my regular programming job it was. And then he says, yes, he says, um, it's, it's quite a change and a feeling of freedom and a lack of stress when you don't have to worry about performance. And I talked about, talk about that for a, few days, for a few seconds, and I thought, wow. He hit the nail on the head. On the head. That's exactly why I had so much fun writing my iPhone app. Because it was a very simple app where there's a bit of user interaction. And once I wrote it and the interaction was smooth, I was done. There was no expectation that, oh my gosh, I have to optimize this to get this three times faster. Because if I made it three times faster, nobody would be able to notice. Because it's still interactive. Right? I'm not saying that every interactive app doesn't have to worry about performance. But this particular app didn't have to. So my day job is not like that. And, uh, although I'd like to make millions writing iPhone apps, I don't think I'm cut out for it. Um, so my day job is to write compilers. And um, people are never satisfied with the speed of compilers. Um, and I believe a lot of you are, are library writers. And uh, if you write a library, often you don't know who your clients will be. Right? So you want it to be as high performance as possible. In fact, um, it was interesting to hear uh, Howard yesterday uh, talk about um, a self-move assignment and how he worried about performance so much that he worried even about you know, checking for that fix. He didn't want to spend that extra cycle because he knows his library is going to be used by thousands of programmers and possibly someone would call that function a gazillion times and a gazillion times a little bit of time is suddenly some noticeable time. So when you write your library, you want a nice programming language that's not going to penalize you up front. And so C++ comes right up as a candidate. It's actually surprising the number of languages that make performance a top priority. It's not that no other language cares about performance. I think most programming languages care about performance. But there's other uh, principles that take priority. It might be purity, it might be safety, uh, maybe some dynamic behavior or something. So for C++, Performance is always an overriding um, concern. And therefore, it's, it's an interesting language to write libraries. So, for sure, C++ has this wonder, wonderful language feature to describe libraries. Uh, no, sorry. No, no, we have a fantastic language to write libraries, but no way to describe libraries in the language. And so that's my segue to modules. Modules are really the language's view of what the library should be. Right. So, what I'm going to do next is to show you a proposal that has evolved over the last couple of years, and at some point was actually scheduled for C++11. Uh, but then, for uh, scheduling reasons, for timing reasons, we couldn't uh, spend more resources on it, and it was cut out at a meeting in Portland. And I'll introduce it to you by, by example. So in a few minutes here, you'll know everything there is to know about, about the modules as I um, envisioned them. So first, the way you, you write your module is you'll um, we'll reuse the export keyword and say export name of my module colon. And those have to be the first tokens in your translation unit and everything after that uh, are contents of your, of your module. There are two kinds of things in your two kinds of declarations in your modules. The public ones, 
which are the things that the, the services you want to offer to your clients as a library provider, and the private ones, which are implementation details. Of course, the, the private ones are still part of your market, and and the, the, the client may actually have some inkling as to what's in there, but it's not going to interfere with your code. So what's the client code going to look like? Well, instead of having an include uh, directive, you have an import directive. So import my life semicolon. Uh, import is not a, uh, an existing keyword for export that managed to uh, reuse an ill fated feature. <laughs> um, it bodes well for, for this proposal, I'm sure. Um, so import is not. I'm going to find someone to donate a kidney. Um, but it turns out, actually, import is an identifier that's used in some places, uh, particularly the queue library has import members. Um, so that is a concern, but uh, I still think we should, we should steal that identifier. Uh, and so that now I can, I can start using whatever is publicly uh, declared in, in the module. So for example, I, I have a type there, there called index type, and uh, I make use of it here, and it just finds index type. And notice that my function is called select, and it, it conflicts with the signature of select in the module, but since it's private, there isn't a real conflict. Um, it may have internal linkage. This uh, module is actually not very well shared library, so it may have some sort of one of those funny uh, shared library uh, linkages, uh, but it's not going to be a conflict. Um, so how is this going to work? We're going to compile the module up there, and we want to keep all of our tool chain more or less compatible. So we don't want to, we want to change as little as possible. So it's still going to produce an object file or a shared, a shared object. Uh, so you still have that. But in addition, we'll generate uh, what I call a module file, which is a sort of a replacement for a header file. It's, it, it, it describes the interfaces that are available. So the client, when you compile the, the, the bottom translation unit, uh, you load that. But instead of being something that you have to parse and, and, and completely traverse before you actually understand the contents, this file is going to be structured so we can efficiently load it. In fact, it will be structured in such a way that we can load only the parts that we need. So if you have, say, a standard library header with 10,000 uh, interface elements, and you only use 10 of it, we shouldn't be spending all our time loading those 10,000 elements. We'll, we'll load, load the table of contents, and then we'll just get the parts we need. But there is a problem here. If you look at the, the declaration of index type, um, I, do you know what index type type is? Size T. So I just I just try to avoid having to deal with uh, modularizing the whole standard library up front, and so I made uh, size T using double type. Now, what is the type of size T? It's implementation defined. It's implementation defined. Now, if you have a compiler, you may well have a couple of different compilation modes. You may have a 32-bit mode and a 64-bit mode. Yeah. And depending on what you compile them, your size T might change. Which means that that module file I talked to you about, if I try to do everything with a single module file, I'd be in trouble because I, I have to say, well, it could be either one of those types. And then you have all the declarations that depend on that, and you start getting a, a tree of declarations that's unmanageable. So in practice, what the module, file, the module system will do, it will generate different uh, module files for different um, compilation options as you go. Uh, just one of the technical difficulties when you try to dis develop this sort of um, system. And I'll come back to that, um, showing some um, various practical issues with that. All right. So now I want to talk about um, multi-level modu module um, composition. So suppose I have two modules, M1 and M2, the literal in this case. All my examples are going to be very highly unrealistic, uh, but I hope they, they convey the mechanisms that are involved. And so in this case, my modules M1 and M2 both export um, a type of uh, One is I1, which is uh, int, and one is I2. I have a little bit higher level module called MM. that Im imports both of these, these basic modules, M1 and M2. But one is imported publicly, and the other is imported privately. Those are different imports. Why are they uh, different? Because when I import MM, any public import will be visible. Uh, any, any public import performed by MM is also visible in the clients of MM. So I can use the type exported by, I1, by M1. So I can use I1 here 
and that's fine, but I can't use L2, that would be an error. I think that's relatively intuitive, uh, but I was surprised to find that, for example, um, C++ CLI assemblies don't work that way. Um, it, it is an important uh, transitive property of import. All right, so we, we know about the general idea of public-private and how, how we import. Let me talk a little bit about the names of modules in this proposal. And you're having a great deal today because you're going to get two proposals for the price of one. So I'm showing you the first one here, and now I'll show you another one a bit later. Uh, and then I'll shoot from the hip, and I'll make a third one. Um, so here I have um, a module whose name is no longer just an identifier. It's two identifiers separated by a double colon. And in fact, my proposal is that you'll be allowed to, to use any number of identifiers separated by columns. And what's the meaning of this? Absolutely none. You give it whatever meaning you want it. There is no connection between, for example, a module called MyLib and a module called MyLib clone clone basics. There's also no connection between a module called MyLib and any other entity in your program called MyLib. You can have namespace MyLib if you want to, and you can make it have a connection by virtue of declaring it only or defining it only in module MyLib, but by, by default there is no, there's no connection. I won't know it like that in the proposal. When we evolved this, at first we tried to tightly bind namespaces to modules. And it turns out people are using namespaces in too many different ways. Even the standard library doesn't fit very well in that model. So, um, so we're, we're not making connection. In fact, namespaces are an exception to the general rule that every entity only has one module to live in. Right? There's, a, there's a, a rule in the standard you probably know, have heard about. It's called the ODR, one definition rule. And the funny thing about it is it, is, it doesn't explain that everything has one definition. It explains when you can have more than one definition. Um, but in the module world, we really want to have a true one definition world, but we'll have one exception, which is uh, modules. The reason why we'll have a, that exception is that suppose, well, I'll do it by example. Suppose you have a, a Boost library. And Boost is really a collection of lots of libraries. You wouldn't want a single module having all of, all of um, Boost in it. Yet there's this namespace boost that various libraries live in. You don't want to say, well, since, it's, since boost can only be defined in one place, you, know, it, you have to make a single module. So that's why namespaces are allowed to live across multiple modules. Uh, one way of thinking about it is that the namespace is more of a tag than a container. Uh, at least for compiler writers, that's a useful uh, idea to implement this, this particular tag. All right, and so on the... On the client code side, it's, it's very much the same thing. You just use this, this name as it is. Notice that I qualify with namespaces. I don't qualify with a module name. The model name is never really used in your program. It's only used in export directives and in import directives. That's for the names of modules. But so far, all my modules have, been, have consisted of one translation in it. And that seems a bit too constraining. We're used to uh, writing fairly large libraries, maybe some of our libraries will be tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands lines of code. We'd like to split, it, split them across multiple translation units. If you do that, mm -hmm. then you have to give a name to each translation unit so that different translation units can co uh, communicate, connect. So the way I propose that is using this documentation uh, to indicate sub-modules. And so now you can, you can say export minor.basis, which means this translation unit is part of a module and we'll, we'll be able to refer to it using the basics name. And I can put some stuff in there. I can have a private function helper and a uh, public function index type. And maybe I have another part of my module where, let's say, a, a select part where I'll implement a select function. And because I'm within the module, I have access to all the private uh, members in other submodules. So I can actually use helper here, provided I have explicitly mentioned that I will, I will import that other sub -model. Any questions at this point? This is uh, by default uh, private. It is by, by default private, although I'm not, I'm not you know, attached to that particular um, choice. 
the x squared in your plot of example should be a colon, right? You're correct. Okay. Thank you. First burger closing models. Thank you. Uh, I do not know. Uh, I'm not All right. Uh, By the way, there's a lot of discussion. We, we, we've been uh, picking this around in the community for a while, and there's been quite a bit of discussion about syntax issues. It's, uh, it goes for, for everybody. If you have a clone there, we put the whole module in, in braces. Uh, that stuff is definitely uh, not solid. Okay, so we've, we've talked about modules. There is an interaction between public and private in, in modules and public and private in classes. Now, you know that in classes, Access specifiers don't control visibility. They control accessibility. What that means is that everything you declare in a class in C++11, uh, where it's private, protected, or public, is visible outside that class. And there, there's some pragmatic reasons why that is, but it's often surprising, especially to new programmers, because you really typically do not want private <coughs> declarations to interfere with your code. Okay? So suppose I have this class here, so at S, one F taking a long, another taking a long, long, it's fairly easy to end up with an ambiguity trying to call F. Even though the one that's private really shouldn't, shouldn't be considered once I'm outside the class. Now, public and private at the module level controls visibility. So if I had an F long and an F long long at the module level, if you're in client code, you'll only see the, the, the public one. So if f long, long, f long long was, was private, it would not even be considered for program resolution. Well, I'm extending that rule to private um, in, in a class uh, context as soon as you get out of the module. So in other words, within, within this uh, module, I can find the private f. In fact, I have to find it in order to be able to put this definition here. I couldn't find this s colon colon f if it were invisible. So in order to parse this, this definition, I have to be able to see it. But once you're in client code for this uh, module, private members become invisible. So when I call, you know, on the S that's being exported from my lab, I call F42, there is no ambiguity. Even though if I had put that same call inside my module, it would be ambiguous because there's no preferred conversion between in to long and into long long. Okay. This actually is, is quite nice. It, it, it solves a lot of problems. I've had uh, occasional bug reports that were hard to track down because of the accessibility rules, and this could probably have saved a lot of time. However, there are some idioms where it's exactly the accessibility and not the visibility property that's important. Now, a lot of those idioms are now taken care of in C++11 using the equal delete notation. So sometimes you make something private, because you want to intercept attempts to call that particular signature and then say, no, you can't. Well, you can do that today in C++11, and, you, and it's better to do it that way by making the, the member public and saying equal the need. So you'll, you'll have a clear indication that that's really what the implementer meant, that this should never call that, that particular signature. But there is another idiom, which is, uh, I was actually not aware of it, uh, but apparently it's pretty popular which is to um, write uh, a private virtual function and then have derived classes override it. And if you do overriding, you have to be able to find what you're overriding. The compiler has to know when I declare my D in another module. So I'm, I'm another, another translation unit is using B as a base class, and I need to override F. Now if F were invisible, as it would be according to the rules I previously explained, the compiler would say, well, okay, this, this, this is a new function. It would, you know, imagine there is no override here. It says, there's a new function here. It's not virtual. It's, it's got no connection at all with B. But in fact, I do want to find a particular, um, a particular virtual function f. Well, C++11 also introduced a new um, mechanism to indicate that you're explicitly overriding something in a base class. Now, I hate this, I hate the syntax. In C++11, normally it should come up here according to C++11, uh, but I like it more there. So, rebel that I am, I have to try this where I like. It. Um, and so, when you have that indication that says, "Oh, I'm overriding something," then the compiler will actually look in that module file and find that private member. So that private member has to be there in the module file; it's just not shown in general. 
not visible in general, L5, and it will resolve uh, the override tables, and it will work just as you'd expect. So uh, I should mention, there's a lot of little issues that, that came up as we, as we uh, worked out uh, this, this version of the modules proposal. Um, after we were able to simplify, just say, you know what, this problem is too big, we don't need to try to solve it. Um, and so we're actually almost done with, with the whole proposal. So in this slide, I now have to deal with um, living in a world where most code is not modules. See, yeah, if, if we had had this on day one, you'd now be able to write modules and write, uh, write nicely structured code, and we'd all be pretty happy. But there's a whole bunch of libraries out there that you'd like to use in your, lab, in your, in your modules. And there's a problem. Suppose I say export my lib private, and I do pound include some header. And that header is not actually a module. What's going to happen? Well, all of those declarations in that header will be specially expanded in my translation unit and will therefore be considered members of my module, which are clearly not. They're part of another library. So I need a mechanism to say, well, there are these things in a world outside that are not modules, but I want to use them anyway. So please be aware of them. You know, part of this thing. And so for that, I have what I call the inline import, which is import open brace. And then you could put an include there, you could, you could write a, a single declaration, like I did print up here. And that is not a member of this module, but I can now call that API. Or well, there could be a, a, a type of in there that comes from somewhere else. So as you see it here, I, I, I do use a, I do have a, a member, public member of my lab that calls printf, and that, that should work. So this is an important uh, transition tool um, for for being able to, little by little, move from an application that has no module to one that you know, transitions each, and each library into a module. Now, there's another thing is, there's a lot of code out there that does pound include. And suppose you have a, a nice library. You're, you're used to offer it as a, you know, as, as a C++ 11 library. So your, your customers are using pound include. And now you'd like to move to a, um, uh, a modules implementation of your library. Well, all that code, you don't want to break it. You, you want it to continue to be able to say pound include. So what you do is you write your header file. Instead of having lots of declarations in there, you just do import my line. And whenever you do an include, you'll now have a very short header file, and you'll have an efficient import of a module. What's more, modules in this proposal are uh, they're completely isolated from uh, macros. In other words, when you do an import, and you had some macros just before that, those macros have no impact on the declarations of your import. <laughs> Thank you. But conversely, if you do an import, there's no way for that import to bring in macros that don't mess up your code. So it's, it's both ways. No macros in, no macros out. <laughs> and, but it might be that your library has some macros you need to provide. Well, the way the module system for macros is called includes. So you put, you put your, your macros in your header file, and you still have it. Now, this seems, this seems like a good idea, but I'll, I'll come back. There, there's some practical issues and transition issues with, uh, with this uh, macro cleanliness. All right, so what have we bought? Okay, well, let's talk again about those macros. And uh, I have a message for you. There's one takeaway from this. <laughs> um, macros are evil incarnate. If we didn't have macro leakage across uh, inclusion, we could actually provide a model system today completely transparent. So if you could, if, if we, if as a compiler, I didn't have to worry about macro changing the meaning of an include header, I would be able to pre-compile that. Uh, Header, and whenever you include, I would efficiently load it up. So, really, macros are the core difficulty in in, um, in modularizing C++ and in efficient building. Um, last February, the committee had a meeting where we started talking about modules again. And Doug Gregor, well, actually, I started giving a presentation, roughly um, what what you just saw, and I mentioned. Uh, an Intel project, Project Intel, 
where in the I think mid 90s they started tracking how much code was in their headers and how much code was in their implementation files. And when they started, it was 50-50. Now that's that's just a amount of text. The header files get included over and over with as .cpp files. You compile them you know, once per build. So really, a lot more code was already being parsed as part of headers and as part of CPP files. Then 10 years later, they found out that it was about 90% of their code in headers and 10% in the CPP files. So the next Doug Gregor uh, of Apple comes up and he presents uh, some ideas about modules himself. And he says, oh, you know, David says 90-10, uh, but we at Apple, we're doing these measurements also. And typically, we're getting 99.9% .9 code in headers and 0.1% code in uh, .m files or .c files or .cpp files. So John Wigley, John, are you here? No. John Wigley, he's, he's attending the meet, uh, this week. Uh, he was sitting there, and he was sort of curious about that claim. So he, he writes up a little script, does a little measurement, and suddenly interrupts Doug as he's going along. He says, hey, I just, I just checked. You're right. It's, I just checked my own code. It's 99.997%. So really, we have a lot of code in our header files, and we can't pre-compile it. And that's slowing down our builds to the point where a lot of projects, that's, that's their main concern. They don't care about optimization. They don't care about <coughs> fast techniques. Every day is a struggle to, to being able to build their project overnight. Um, but also, it really affects the programming tools that we can have in, in C++. Uh, it's sort of funny that we, we have a language here that's been around for 30 years. And there's some really interesting tools out there. There's some much younger projects, much younger languages, that have tools that are very impressive to comp compare to what we can do in C++. And most of it is because we have difficulties anticipating what macros uh, will do to, uh, to source code compile with eventually C. So the big deal about modules is that you could have fast builds uh, if, if we had it. Uh, how's that? <coughs> if macros are so evil, will we have a replacement for a facility like the CERT that really does depend upon macros to have its semantic? Um, so, so, uh, so the question is, would we have a CERT, a replacement for a CERT? And the answer is, I think not. It is okay to have a few ahead of files out there. I don't think we'll be able to kill macros. So a CERT will remain a non-modular ahead, is, is my guess. Uh, but perhaps, perhaps, perhaps I'm wrong. In fact, I'm, I'm going to come back to that because I'm going to show you a second proposal for modules. And although it introduced a level of macro sanity, it's, it's a little different. And it, it might be enough for a cert. Now there's more to modules. This is, you know, fast build is sort of the signature thing, the thing you'll most directly notice if you have a, 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 a good module system in C++. But by having imports, we now have a clear model of what is our kernel <coughs> code and what is our library code, which means we have explicit dependencies between <coughs> translations, between libraries. And that's really interesting, because once you have that, you can make a big step forward with respect to the ordering of initializations. You might, be, you might have run into problems where you have one library that has some dynamic initialization that needs to happen and another one that relies on it and needs this initialization to happen after the first library. But because there's no way in C++ to actually say that, uh, you end up with problems sometimes where, what, where you call into a library that hasn't been initialized yet and uh, crashes and sue. Well, I think with, um, with modules, because we have these explicit dependencies, we could solve that. And it's not trivial. There's some rules that have to be put in in terms of uh, avoiding cycles and and, and things like that. Uh, I've learned a lot from a man called uh, Jean-Marc Bourget, who is a French representative in committee and help, has helped me a lot to, uh, to understand all the, the trickiness here. But um, the good news is there is hope to at least make it much better, if not airtight. And then, this I think is a, it's actually a, something that's close to the heart of David Abraham. Uh, there's a lot of properties of simple functions that the compiler can deduce. For example, there's a lot of functions that, without you saying anything, the compiler actually knows it won't throw an exception. The compiler might know it doesn't access uh, globally uh, available memory. Uh, it might only 
read, 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 some, read some memory, or not even touch any memory. Um, you might find a lot about uh, the way it uses pointers, and notice that there's nothing, nothing funny going on. Now, it'd be nice if you could pass that on to client code so that the client code compiler can say, oh, I can optimize this much better than with no assumptions at all, because I know you're not going to mess with my work variables, for example. And so I can reschedule code across the call. Now that's the kind of optimization a compiler can easily do if it knows the properties of the function. Now most um, commercial compilers today have um, what's called whole program optimization or link time optimization. But in practice, it's not used that often because I think it scales relatively poorly. And now different, you know, I know I know some compilers claim that they're they're doing much better at that, but still in practice. People don't like to turn on link time optimization, in part also because it, it really increases your build times. But in a module system, these properties can be communicated through that module file I talked about earlier. And so you'd have increased runtime performance with pretty much no build time increase, or in fact, improved build, time, build times. All right. So how do you like the module so far? Any questions? Part of that was because most of their code was templates. So you have not shown an exporting templates from a module. How does that work? It, it just works. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 imagine having included it. It'd be the same thing, but no macros have any effect on, on that template. Now there are some subtleties. There, there are funny things like friends. And what does it mean to make a friend T with T is a template parameter? And then suddenly you're also the module, but you know, I never made the privates available because you, you can't make it a friend. So there are limitations in very common cases, in, in very odd code, and you can, you can actually solve a lot of those limitations. Uh, but mostly, it, it just worked the way you expect. Uh, David, there was a Google Summer Code project a couple of years ago that was trying to emulate the, the module system of you had back then uh, using uh, essentially generating true files and the source files from it. Uh, is, there, is the project still going on, or is it just that? Well, I, I saw the project going by. I think someone might have sent me an email about it, but I was not actually involved. I, I, I may have sent them a document that, that's about it, so I, I don't know, I don't know yeah, what the situation is. Yeah. I mean, I was loosely connected to that, because the guy was using Wave at that point, uh -huh. as, a, as a preprocessor, and, and to cause that problem. Uh, would that be a viable option? question is, could we, could we sort of simulate or emulate the idea of modules using mm -hmm. header files and maybe small preprocessor extensions? And the answer is, I think, to a large extent, yes. And certainly it could be, a, like, if you want to implement implementation experience, or rather user experience, but we don't want to put the full cost of implementing it, that might be a step forward. However, I'm going to talk about something else later that might sort of make the whole point more. Uh, I, I know there was a hand on the right earlier. Go ahead. Um, curious what the juice juice was for um, private exports as opposed to just putting private things in a non exported header file. Like there's a private section of the export, but the importer can't see it. Seems oh, well, the reason is I want all my code in one place. Okay. I don't want to be forced to, create, to go move all my private stuff to some other file. Um, now, 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 you know it's also like that. I had this issue with, with uh, private virtual functions, and I, I have to actually export those. Yeah. There's a couple of other cases. Like I mentioned friends earlier. You know, you might, you might make a, um, like suppose you have a public inline function that calls a private function. That private function has to be in the module file. A whole bunch of little things that they're not visible to your code per se, but the compiler has to know about them. Uh, I don't think, no, the yours, I'll go from back to front. Instead of uh, imports, uh, you use included as a keyword, which might be a lot of this, uh, people probably don't use it. 
um, we might. Uh, uh, I haven't thought about it. Um, Scrapes me is really wonderful work. It also strikes me that it's complex enough that there's no way to know to spot a lot of problems until it's implemented and used. So have you given any thought to a process of, of essentially verifying it by, by use or it becomes standard? Uh, yes, I should start implementing it. But uh, I'm going to show you there. Doug Rider is, is racing far ahead of me. <laughs> um, so, so you'll see we're, we're we're in a much better position than you than than it might look like so far. So if you said uh, templates in modules, how are they not vulnerable to problems of old exports? Are we never going to see those problems again? What were the problems of old exports? There was there was paper about it. Um, well, I never had to buy with it. Right. Export. So basically, there were products to mass increase build speeds, and in practice, they didn't really do any. Uh, yeah, well, they were expected, there were actually no problems, they were expected to increase build speed, they didn't. Um, that's because it's not, see, export was an attempt to modularize just templates, but not functions, not ordinary static data, and these things like that. And so it didn't work very well. This model, think of it as improved, but cached. Right? So some people think of it as pre compiled headers. Now, the problem with pre compiled headers is that you have to you're pre-compiling a whole prefix of a transition unit, and you change one header, and basically everything goes, you know, gets rebuilt. It's, it's kind of painful. Here, you change one header, and only that one header has to be re retouched. Uh, there's a hand in front. Yeah. Is the module file that you speak of exactly the publicly well-defined interface that people can utilize to build tools other than? Thank you so much for leading me to my <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the module file. I uh, stole a slide from a presentation I gave about the horrors of compiling C++. This is a, um, a sketch of your textbook compiler. C++ compilation is not your textbook compiler, but this will actually do for our discussion. So compilers typically are broken down in two parts, the front end, which deals with the language per itself, and the back end, which deals with the target. Ideally, you would want the front end to not know anything about the target, and the back end to not know anything about the, uh, the language. In reality, it's not like that. For example, the front end has to know size of int. So in C++, it's not like that. Some languages do really achieve a, a very clean separation. And so then you, you have a pipeline, at least uh, in principle, a pipeline of operations that happen to compile your code. Let me go quickly through it. You start with your code, which is treated as a character stream. Uh, you think that's simple, but it's actually incredibly complicated because some people write different header, header files in one encoding, and then they include it in a file in another encoding, and so on, and they don't, you know, it's pretty complicated. But let's forget about that. We transform those characters into tokens. The tokens get um, you find the grammar in them, so you create a, a parse tree. Then you figure out the semantics, you annotate the parse tree with the meaning of all these, uh, the nodes in your tree. Uh, you might do some diagnostics, some possibly do some things on the side. And then you, you have the annotated parse tree and you'll pass that to the back end. Typically you don't pass the tree itself to the back end, typically you'll have some intermediate representation, IR. And that goes to the back end, which first will look at all this IR, will rearrange it, optimize it to some degree. So you have optimized IR, then it maps that to your target um, uh, architecture. That itself is actually an important part of optimization, so the scheduling, register allocation, a couple of other things that happen at that point. And finally, you produce some object code. All right, today's model of libraries, which the language is unaware of, the you know, language has no idea what a header file is other than but text, um, has two parts. One part is the object files. At the very bottom, you completely processed, almost. The linkers has to do some work, and unfortunately, that's getting increasingly costly. Uh, but at least, you don't have to go, you know, once you link, you don't have to redo all this work through, through the pipeline. Now, header files at the complete opposite end. We have to redo all our work. Now, when we import our modules, we'd like not to have to redo all this work. 
you don't want to tokenize parts, do semantic analysis, and so on. Right? We really want our modules to be here, at the level where the front end still understands it, because if you, if you give it IR, the front end doesn't, you know, IR is sort of a lower level representation. You cannot necessarily extract everything out of it. So you really want that annotated parse to input. So we'd like our own files to be there. Now that's a problem, and, and Jeff just alluded to it. Because the format that a compiler uses internally is proprietary, it's compiler dependent, it's actually version dependent. I make, you know, on a work day, more likely than not, I will change the internal representation of our semantic trees. Right? And it's, you know, it's not human readable. We have a tool to sort of turn binary stuff back into, into some, some kind of readable uh, format, but it's, it's not very pleasant. Right? So although we really want our module files to be that kind of representation, it's, it's very unfriendly. You know, if, if, I have, if, you, if you're a Linux vendor, like you, 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 you want to sell a static analyzer, today you, you just work with source. But if you start distributing files and modules within binary files, they'll have to reverse engineer everything. It'll, it'll, it'll be a nightmare. Instead of modules improving the tool landscape, they'll actually worsen it. So therefore, our module files will have to be character strings. In fact, they will look a lot like header files that will be generated by the compiler. But it'll be readable and it'll be generated from your source. And what's going to happen, uh, and it's going to be mostly C++ code, so it'll be compiler independent, version independent, and it'll be human readable. It'll be standard. But the first time you do an import across all your projects for a particular set of command line options, the compiler will have to parse it and do this whole first part of the pipeline that I was showing earlier. But then it will put in a cache on the side. And next time you do an import, either for that build or for another build, completely independent build, you'll have a precompiled module and the, the import will be near, near instantaneous. All right. But so far, I've shown you modules as I, as I imagined them. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about the history of this proposal. Uh, when I started learning C++ about, I don't know, 20 years ago, um, the thing that caught my eye were operator, operators. And I thought, oh, I know, I'm going to write a matrix library. It's going to be fun, it's going to have operators, multiplication, I'll even you know, have a division to solve the equations and whatnot. I was very young and naive back then. <laughs> and, uh, Within a day or two, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm generating temporaries all over the place. This is highly inefficient. So then I started working on that. And eventually, I came to a place where I decided I would propose metaprogramming facilities as a first class facility in the language. And so there was actually somewhere on the web uh, an old proposal for my, of mine called Metacode. It wasn't really formally proposed. Um, but the idea was that you'd be able to um, write but my purpose really for it was I'd be able to write my matrix library, which that's pretty much all I've been working on for the last couple of decades, um, by, by building in an optimizer in my library. So you'd write an expression, uh, uh, a matrix expression, I'd, I'd map all that on Metacode, and then my Metacode would figure out the best way to reorder the operations <coughs> and, and allocate the various temporary matrices, so it, it's really minimal. And then I realized I actually implemented uh, uh, about half of that feature, enough to be able to start testing medical functions. And I started realizing I'm putting all this code in my header fonts. It's already bad, but with medical, it's going to be an order of magnitude worse. <coughs> because pretty much all of your medical is going to end up in header fonts. Compilation times will be horrible. I need to come up with a better idea. And so I started with a scheme that uh, implemented modules on top of namespaces. And uh, it wasn't very good. But shortly thereafter, we had a meeting in Kona, and I was sitting next to Dave Abrahams, and we were looking at some uh, hairy problem, and Dave says, gosh, you know, this language really needs a module system. And Gary Strutter, the inventor of C++, uh, who's chairing me as well, he says, I don't disagree, but we have nothing to start with. We have no, you know, we don't really know what, what we even mean by, by, by that term. And so I was sitting next to Dave and said, 
and said, you know, actually I have this little sketch here for, for modules for medical. You know, and, and I showed it to him, and over the break he goes to Bjorn and says, David has this thing, you should take a look at it. So Bjorn says, well, we have a little extra time. David, why don't you come up and, and present it? And I presented it, and it was, there was, was a strong interest in it, and so I was encouraged to evolve it, and with the help of a lot of people, people like Peter Dimov and David Abrahams and a lot, a lot of people, uh, evolving what you're seeing so far. Then, it was, it was actually at that point, slated for C++ OX. But then we ran out of time, we cut out, out a whole bunch of features. Concept stayed that, that one meeting, but modules were gone. And it went to sleep. And then last February, the committee decided, well, let's take a look again. And we're looking at producing two standards, one in 2017, one in 2022. Those are tentative dates. 2017, we're looking for relatively small core extensions. And then anything that's bigger, we have to go into 2022. So again, we had a little extra time. We looked at, uh, I presented uh, a bit of modules. Then Doug Greger got up and said, well, we at Apple, we're really having this problem with header files. Right? And I mentioned earlier this 99.99 whatever uh, percent of code in their header files. And actually, they have this with our templates. They have this with just the, the Objective-C uh, frameworks. Um, so he says, so, so we have started working on this for real. And so, he says, we have an idea that we're implementing Clang, and I'll call that proposal Clang Modules. Now, Clang Modules approach the problem differently. For Apple, it's really important that they can use this from day one. And not just for Apple, for a lot of people. It'd be nice if all this code that you've written could be seen as a module if you've, if you've been reasonable with your header files. And most people don't do like really, really weird things in the header files. So he has taken the approach that he designate a group of headers for the library as a module. So imagine you have a directory, has a bunch of headers, and four of these headers will be one module. Well, in that directory will live a file, and it's called module.map in the client implementation. And that file describes how to group different headers into a module. I'll show you an example of a module map file a little bit later. And it follows the same principle that I talked about earlier, the idea of caching pre-compiled uh, modules. In fact, it even automatically keys off include, uh, upon include. It has, it has an, an explicit import syntax, a bit like the one I showed earlier, but it also works with pound include. So if you turn on modules and you do pound include, normally, <coughs> The compiler just goes down your, your search path, finds your header file, and brings it in. But if you have a module map file, the compiler notices that, notices that your .h file, which is a particular file that you're including, is one of those files that forms a module. And instead of um, just actually including a file, it will compile all four files as one module interface set, so a module file, and put that in a cache. And it'll just load that whole assembly of files using a module just like in the other proposal. <coughs> All right. uh, any questions at this point? Just let me show you the same how this works. Yeah, yeah, it's a file, it's a file, yeah, it's a file system. It's, think of it as a pre-compiled header, except you don't have the constraints of the pre-compiled header. And it's done automatically. Now, there's a couple of interesting things about the client approach. One is, if you have macros in your headers, you have to make it up, because they, they really want this to work transparently. So you, code that already exists today has to, has to work with this. And of course, code that exists today does have macros that, that, that client code uses. In fact, if you think about C headers, a lot of the standard library functions in Cs, standard permits them to be macros. So they have to make it out of the module. And so in the client module system, macros can come out of, um, of modules. Now macros that you define in your code will not affect the import. So you didn't have that planning. But macros that you define in your command line do make it. And in fact, for every different set of macros that you define in the command line, it creates a separate module file. So to come back to Elzer's earlier, 
if you think about S sort of H with N debug, and you only control it on the command line, this scheme actually solves it. Let's look at um, what the module mark file that looks like right now. Um, so here's my attempt at making a, a module file for the standard library. Now I should say the there is an implementation of this today. It works quite well for C and Objective C. And I'd, I'd encourage you if you if you have a, if you're familiar with building Clang to, to build the current um, the, the, the Git version. Uh, I don't know if it's in any release, if the modules are in any of the releases, maybe the latest, I'm not sure. Um, be there'll be 3.1, okay. So, so to, to give it a shot and, and try it out, it's, free. it's kind of fun to, to see that work. Um, this will not work, but, this, but I'm just trying to uh, illustrate with a C++ example rather than an objective C example. Um, so this map says, well, there's a model SCD, and it contains sub-modules. And for example, it contains a submodule stdio, and that, that's a module you form it by pre-compiling header stdio.h. Now there could be multiple headers in a single in a single submodule, or it could be multiple headers in the in the top level module. But in this case, uh, it's just one header. Um, so you can you can import std by itself. If you do that, all of the submodules will be imported also. But you can also import scd.scdio, and then you only get the scdio part. Notice that this is different from, um, from the proposal earlier where the colon colon had no, had no effect. You know, the, but it, you know, importing, say, my lab did not imply that you import also my lab colon colon anything. It's a little bit different. Now you can put, in addition, you can put requirements in modules. So for example, you can say, well, SCD also has a module vector, which, uh, whose contents is basically the contents of the, of the header vector. But you shouldn't try to import this if you're not compiling C++. So there's a requirement for C++. And the client compiler has a, has a bunch of, of those requirements, things like Objective-C, Objective-C++, and so on. Um, there's also the idea of, of an explicit module. Say, for example, I stream you don't want to automatically bring in uh, all the consequences of, of including or importing as stream, because remember here the, the, it is very much like including. Uh, so you say explicit. That means that even though it's part of the module SCD, when you do an import of SCD, you don't get as stream. You have to explicitly say import SCD dollar stream if you want that part of it. Um, you also have the idea of uh, transitive. Uh, transitive imports. So if you want an import of ice cream to also automatically import locales, for example, you, you have a way to express that in the module map file. Now the module map file is completely outside the header itself, which means that you can introduce modules in a library that doesn't belong to you. Right, so it's very powerful in terms of, um, in terms of uh, moving forward with modules and, and migrating towards a model with modules. In fact, the Apple system is even able to fake up a module map if it recognizes certain structures on, on the system. For example, if you're familiar with macOS, uh, it has this notion of frameworks, which are directories that are you know, mostly containing libraries and header files. And if it recognizes that you're trying to use one of those in, in, in include, and it doesn't have a module map, it will actually make a module map for you on the fly. Uh, not necessarily on the file system. I don't, remember, I don't think it gets totally fast. But, but, but to compile these as a module. And so it, it starts tuning those things as modules. And uh, Doug mentioned that, um, that uh, it's actually working really well. It's, it's already competitive on, on real projects. Uh, these are not C++ projects, but on real projects, it's competitive with uh, pre-compiled headers. Uh, and that's without having done any tuning, whereas the projects were tuned for pre-compiled headers very, very carefully. So let's talk a little bit about the strengths and weaknesses of this alternative approach. And one is uh, availability. This is already available today in C and Objective C, and uh, I've got good hope that um, it's going to move quite quickly forward uh, from C++. That's uh, really important for us to understand what exactly it is that we want out of the module. It's, it's nice to theoretically think about these things, but it's, it's even better to have some uh, 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 experimentation. Today. Now, the ease of transition is fantastic with this system. Because, like I said, you can transition to modules 
any any library that's out there that's been reasonably written, you know, unless you do very odd tricks in your in your in your header files, you're going to be able to transition to this model system without too much pain. In fact, Dog has gone out of its way to find ways to even accommodate certain certain weird things that happen mostly in system headers. It's, it's amazing how you know, some of the things that, that uh, people do with macros just to define size t. Um, now, in terms of ease of programming, um, I think that's debatable. I like my code to all be in one place. I, I, I like, uh, in terms of the model, I prefer the other model. Um, but it's, it's still quite, quite usable. Now, there is no visibility control at this point in the system. However, there's work going on to do some of that. In fact, I, I think I might be wrong about that. Uh, I think uh, Channel Proof has uh, think, told me that. Uh, Channel, are you here? <coughs> right. uh, I think there's some, some already up for macros. So you can already control macros as an extension. So um, your module map may not control visibility. But if you're willing to use some extensions in your source file, you can say that a certain macro is private, so it doesn't come out of your module. Um, but, by, but by default, uh, they, do, they do leak out. Now, you can easily imagine that you could add some facilities to a module map to basically say, don't, don't um, export macros by default, or only export the following macros, which I really intend to, to make available to my client code. Now, Perhaps the most fundamental difference between this approach and the other approach is that in this approach, modules are purely an interface uh, mechanism. The module system never sees the implementation. So you can't solve the initialization argument, because initialization argument is really about dependencies between the implementation, not dependencies between header files. Um, so, so that is something that would be more challenging to retrofit uh, to the client module uh, model. And similarly with uh, the idea of cross translation in properties and optimization, that is not something that easily comes out of that. So then, could we do something about bringing those two together? <coughs> so when we, when after Doug showed some of this in um, in Kona in February, we uh, went to a chat, and Chandler was at the uh, at that meeting. Dave was there, and. Uh, we talked about, well, is, could we possibly bring those two together? And Chandler, in particular, had a couple of great ideas. And now I'm shooting from the hip, and I'm showing you what perhaps we could do. Okay, so I just made this up yesterday. Uh, but imagine that we have our module map, but instead of having a file that's sort of this separate language on the side, then we could say that the first model I showed you, the, the one with export keyword and so on, that we could annotate it to say, well, you're not going to get from me the implementation. I'm only going to give you the interfaces. And we could also annotate it to say, well, I have to export markers here. Could we rewrite this in a way that kind of looks like, like that model? Could we make it like, look like this? So I still have my export STD column like I did before, but now, I have a, an attribute on there that says you have to map includes as if they were uh, as if they were uh, uh, the right key imports. Right. And then um, I could nest exports to make submodules on the fly. Remember, in my original proposal, submodules were translationaries. But maybe I could say, well, you can also do parse translationaries. So I'd be able to say export dot stdio, and I could say on that export, well, for this particular one. I want to export markers. And I could have an effector, much like I had in the module map, I could put some annotation, and maybe I don't need the, vector, the markers from vector, so that one I just export, but I say that it has to be C++. And so you can see how we could, we could make it look like the other one. In fact, for the compiler, it would be very much the same thing. It would just not have the implementations. And so it couldn't do things that it would do with the implementations. But it could still make the members of the modules, pre-compile them, create a module file, that would be cool. That's our vision for what might be the future. So, want some more? Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I'm out of slides. But there is a study group in the committee called SG2. Doug Greger is appropriately the, the head of that group. 
And so if you're interested in that, I, I recommend you try to get into the reflector for that and uh, see what we'll come up with. Hopefully, I'm really hoping for something by the C++17 time frame because I want modules now. Thank you. <laughs>
stay clear for that until we actually have logic in the language. Then we can start piling up whatever you want. Uh, so I think you just answered my question, but I was going to wonder, I was going to ask if um, we thought about addressing uh, the versioning issues with modules. Yes, I have thought about it. It scares me. So <laughs> I have to stay away from it. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, it, 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 it is a very tricky problem. And it's, uh, I'm not sure we can even solve it using modules. Uh, uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping there is no solution that would require us to know the solution ahead of time to, get, to design modules. Uh, so I'm hoping that we can we can make one step having modules somewhere around this level. <coughs> and if there is a solution for versioning that we can still migrate forward and not find out that we train ourselves in the corner. Uh, so definitely tricky tricky and unfortunately really important problem. Right. So we'll continue to compile it uh I think that would still be left to to your build system. So not necessarily the compile itself, but you whatever system is a, is aware of a module. Actually no, the compiler will for the module files it will it will track timestamps and so I think if I'm in competition just stats and, and cache stats. So, so the client client does is it stores a lot of Like timestamp of the of the origin source and set of macros and the compiler options and basically when it tries to read it, it checks and if it's out of date, it's rebuilt. Right. But on top of that, I think the build system will also, you know, just like it now checks the dependencies on header files, it will check the dependencies on, on module as well. Um, uh, how was the actually design? Once modules are a solved problem, are we going to hear more about better code again? Uh, yes. Thanks a lot. I have two comments. One, one, just a response about the, the timestamps issue. Uh, just, just to be aware, uh, we, we do know that timestamps aren't necessarily sufficient. Um, I talked to Doug about this when he put timestamps in, and he was like, I, 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 I want a prototype now. And so I think there is some idea to do more, more careful checking with digests and other, other more rigorous checking long term. But timestamps work and they're fast. So uh, the other thing I did want to say is when uh, Vijay and I were talking about this particular uh, kind of hybrid proposal, something that you didn't, you didn't talk to, but I really, I, th I think it's the most exciting aspect of it is that I, if, if I'm writing a library and I, I write it I, I port the existing library to this system. I can start adding new code or replacing small pieces of the library with the exact syntax you proposed at first. And right. I can start incrementally getting all of the additional benefits. Right, that is a good point. I didn't mention that. But since now we're in that export model, you can imagine that you can mix it up so some parts would be using the, the, the include mapping, and some parts you just use all that syntax that I introduced in the part, first part. And you could do this gradually, so the new code could use that, and maybe, as China says, you could move stuff out of headers and into here, little by little. Um, I think I found out I'm not sure. Well, thank you.